Catch your breath. Many times in life, when we go through the most difficult of times, our mind becomes like that rat race. Our mind becomes so engaged in trying to fix the problems that we truly feel like our heart is beating a thousand times a minute. Our mind does not stop working. But we are reminded to catch our breath. I thought Psalm 46 was strangely appropriate, considering all the flooding and devastation that's happening. And I don't know if it affected you in that way, but when I thought of God speaking to us about the waters that foam and rise, and what's it say? Though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. And it reminds us in this song multiple times that God is there. It says that God is in the midst. God is there. The Lord of hosts is with us. And then we hear, be still and know that I am God. Catch your breath. Catch your breath. Now, I don't know if you feel like life kind of treats you like that sometimes. Um, I think it's pretty obvious that my last month was like that. Um, but it's a great reminder. What do you think of when you think of being told to be still? One of the things that I thought of was one of the commandments that I actually have probably never preached on. And I should. Be still and know that I am God should remind us of taking a Sabbath rest, taking a break, catching our breath. How many of you have already read the October newsletter article. So, you got a head start. I've said this before, I often don't know if I'm writing a sermon or a newsletter article, and it's sometimes both. Have you ever said to yourself, where did the summer go? Where did this year go? I think if you're human, you've done that, right? We've all done that. In the article that, I, that I'm referring to is the article that I submitted that is in the newsletter, and I, I address mindfulness. Not that being mindful or having this heightened awareness of the passing of time and trying to have appreciation for everything, it doesn't cause time to go any slower, but it puts you in the right reference in relation to God. It puts you in the right frame of mind in which to tackle life. When we're in a where when we're in a slowed down state and we are still recognizing who God is, we are far more likely to hear his spirit leading us, to feel the tug of the spirit in a different direction. To reassure us when we have when we need peace that we will get it. We're much more likely to not be afraid and to have courage when we need courage. The faster we go trying to figure out all of the solutions for life's problems, the less likely it is that we actually find them. Now that's a hard truth and reality to live. 
It's almost as if God has wired us in exact, exactly the opposite of what we should be, right? But really, this is the result of sin. The result of being a human person, right? Our mind tries to outthink God. As I think about what it is to take a Sabbath rest, I realize that I do a very poor job of that. I think that in general, our culture does a very poor job of taking a Sabbath rest. Culturally, if you take a day off, you're lazy. You're throwing your life away, right? You've got things to do. Games to go to. Kids to get to someplace else. And to do this or that. Sometimes you need to take a Sabbath rest and just be still and know who God is. Now, in some sense, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir because... If you're not good at this, if we're not good at this, we're, we're actually sort of in trouble. We need to get good at this if we're not. Because we, as the salt of the earth, the light of the world, as Christ calls us, can demonstrate the value to others. That it's okay to catch your breath. It's okay to slow down. And sometimes we don't like to slow down because we don't like to spend time with ourselves. And that's a problem too. We have to get comfortable with being who we are and being that in God's presence and being real with God. You know, I had a tree when I was in Florida that we had a storm come through. I had a tree that was really big in our backyard. And you know how this ground can be pretty soft there, but um, this tree just came down and crashed on our little shed in the backyard. And Have you guys ever filed a, an insurance claim for your home or something like that? It's even in car insurance too, it's, it's in there. But I, I think that uh, it's interesting that uh, insurance is, uh, they're like good reformed church people actually because they believe in the act of God, right? They believe that God, even, even the secular folks, they believe that God's doing something out in the world, right? All these folks that may be filing claims in Florida, God, in South Carolina, and I'm sure everywhere between there, it's going to be bad. But God is busy right now, according to those insurance companies. A lot of acts of God. God, in the midst of everything, is true and real. We're reminded of that here in this passage. I'm in the midst. I am there. The insurance company recognizes it. And we always scratch our heads and say, really? But yes, even in that. So when I filed my claim when that tree came down, I knew that God was at work. I still don't know what God was doing. We don't know sometimes. But God's doing something. Today as we take communion together and join with millions around this world, I would like to be still and know that He is God. Trusting Him with all of the things that are even the most difficult of things to trust God with. Sometimes that means our hearts. The things that are precious to us. The thing that we care about the most and the things that grieve us the most. All of those things we bring to God. And we say, here I am. We're going to be still in your presence. I love this scripture. The Lord of hosts is with us. 
God is in the midst of the city. I am in the midst. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with tumult. God is our refuge and strength. Let's remember to take a breath today. I wanted to keep it short today because communion, when you do it right, does take a little bit of time. But, how many of you guys like to get nostalgic? Some people don't. Some people hate thinking about, like, taking the time to remember. But that's a part of being still and remembering. When Jesus instituted the first communion, and he sat with his disciples in that upper room, and he said those, those words that we use in the formula of communion, as often as you do this, what does he say next? Remember me. And it certainly takes time to be still, to remember. But they go so well, hand in hand, don't they? Do you remember the first communion that you ever took? Probably not. Can you remember being young and taking communion? And think about that for a moment. What it was like in that experience. Think about the building and where you were. Those that were around you. Was it warm or chilly like it is right now? It's a little chilly in here and chilly. I feel okay, but it's on the cool side. I can remember the first times that I took communion. I don't know if it's the first time. But I remember that it was at a little church called the Chapel of Praise, my home church in Kentucky. And we would have had little crackers, little cracker wafers, and the same kind of little juice cups that we serve here. That's what we would have had there. And we would do it very much like we do it here. Everyone would get their elements, and in that setting it was thought of as a symbol. Those were symbols only, although it's more than that here. And we'd go back to our seats, and we all had our individual seats that we'd go back to. And there'd be like a hundred people that we'd all take communion together. Now, how meaningful or special was that? There's a bit of a mystery there, isn't there? The Reformed Church itself talks about communion in a way that I like. It affirms that though there is mystery there, something is happening. Something that we can't quite identify, but we are spending time with the Lord in that remembrance. Now, if you didn't grow up as a, as a Reformed person, or maybe you were a Lutheran, as you, you, is that what you were, Jeff, when you were younger? Yes. Yep. And so, like we talked about last week, you believe the teachings of Luther, Martin Luther, right? And in that teaching, Christ is in, with, and under the bread. Right? Yes. In, with, and up, he would have taught. For us, we would think more in terms of what Calvin taught, or maybe Zwingli taught, some people that we don't know from long ago. And that we would think that, according to Calvin, that Christ is present. And it might be in a spiritual sense, but it could also be in a real sense. 
but there's mystery there. And this, of course, was a part, a break from the Reformation, during the Reformation, a break from the Catholic Church. They all said, no, we don't want to be like the Catholic Church and think that it is the body of Christ. But guess what? It's okay if you believe that too. How many of you grew up Catholic? And when you took communion, and maybe this is still how you take communion, you believe that you're partaking of the body of Christ, the blood of Christ, that it somehow is there. Regardless of how you think of it, what does Christ tell us to do? Do it in remembrance of Him. And so all these theologians that debated long ago, would they take communion together? I hope so. I think so. We would call them to take communion together today. That's what we would do. How many of you guys have a fond memory of communion? And how many of you, now that you know I'm going to ask you to speak, still have that fond memory? You're going to pretend like you did.
I saved your cup for your story to be special. <laughs> Anybody else want to share? I don't, but I do remember at the campus is getting a brand new little Bible, a rosary, a little plate. It was a time for me to get a lot of presents. I wish I could say more than that. But I do say that God's grace is so great. It just should, it includes everybody, regardless of our little differences. We love Christ and this way to celebrate his love for us. Amen. There is something kind of alluring about a rosary. Yeah, isn't there? Absolutely. You know? I, I admit it. Anybody else want to share? Well, in the same tradition that we remember, in the same way that we can remember our communion, we can remember the very first communion. And as we think of Christ sitting with his disciples today, breaking bread, drinking wine, we know that they had fellowship. They took the time to be a part of each other's life. And I'm so grateful that we are here together today. The format is not around a table per se, although we will join at the table. But what we do is the same thing. We remember that as we partake of the bread, we remember that Christ gave himself for us. That his broken body means something for us today. That his still blood means the forgiveness of our sins. And though there is mystery in that, we, we know that Christ strengthens us through it. It's considered one of the two sacraments of the church for a reason. It's considered a means of grace that God, through this time, imparts His grace to us, reaffirms His grace. And so as we remember that, we remember that God is in the midst of all of it. God is with us. God is here through all. Amen.